Hello everyone, and welcome to Resurrection Lutheran Church for this fourth Sunday in Lent. May our worship today be glorifying to God and a blessing to you. Amen. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We now pause for a moment to reflect on our sins and the forgiveness we're promised in Jesus. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you. A reading from Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? and I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, 
because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our texts for this Sunday come from Ephesians 2 and the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, as just read. During this Lenten season, we as a congregation have been working our way through the 40-day being challenge, and this week we'll be focusing on the fourth keystone habit observed in the life of Jesus, that being to seek solitude. So in this morning's sermon, first we will focus on the importance of seeking solitude and being with God. Second, we will reflect on the solidity of faith that occurs when we do, as being with God strengthens our belief in God. And third, we'll consider the solidarity of Christ and how his mercy revives us to be living for him. So let's begin. First of all, it's important to note that solitude differs from isolation, because the latter is involuntary exclusion, whereas solitude is a discipline, a deliberate separation from distraction. Indeed, many people fear being alone, because on our own, we feel exposed. In silence, our personal, innermost thoughts, desires, and regrets are amplified. Furthermore, in the absence of others, we can see ourselves clearly for who we are. There's no one left to compare ourselves with. It's just us and God. At first, this may be uncomfortable for us, but the more we do it, the more natural it becomes. And solitude is crucial for the type of self-reflection that can lead to repentance, which is why it's so important. Even Jesus, who knew no sin, would frequently retreat and seek solitude. As it says in Luke 5, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. And in doing so, he was not simply seeking time for his own, but alone time with God, his heavenly Father. Likewise, Jesus bids us do the same in Matthew 6, 6, saying, When you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This proves that prayer is not simply a soliloquy. God is listening and in the silence of solitude, we may even hear him speaking. Thus solitude with God is not solitary confinement. It's the opposite. It's freeing. And in prayer and meditation, we find heavenly company. When this pandemic first began, a large percentage of the population was seriously isolated, and it seemed as if Paul Simon's prophetic poetry was coming to fruition. I touch no one, and no one touches me. I am a rock. I am an island. Though a good song, that's bad advice. Men posing as rocks are not nearly as strong, and before too long will start to crack, acting more and more like inanimate objects, emotionally broken and weighed down by loneliness. Likewise, being a human island is no vacation either. An island without vis visitors is hardly paradise, but rather a forgotten dried drop in the ocean. So, one of the first things we did as a congregation was make sure that we were still in the Word of God, in fellowship with our Savior, even though we were isolated from each other. Obviously, human interaction is vital to one's personal well-being, just as seeking solitude with the Almighty and being with God is vital to our soul. Without personal time with God, we're not whole. Not being with Him leaves us incomplete. Because as human beings, God did not create us to simply be something that exists, but to be living for a purpose, and we're meant to be in communion with Him. Spending quiet, contemplative moments in the absence of distraction and solely focused on His Word and prayer, giving Him our undivided attention, 
and being truly present with him. Isolation leaves us feeling empty and lonely and restless, but solitude with God is fulfilling and leaves us spiritually refreshed. Of course, whenever we do seek solitude, we need also consider the desired result. What's the goal? Why are we leaving? Where are we going? And who are we seeking? Is it simply to be by myself, spend time with my thoughts and listen to my own heart? Or is it to be with my God, spend time with him in prayer and listen to his word? Am I running away from home or retreating to the Lord? Because there's a big difference and the devil has a preference. He despises the latter. And Jesus' parable from our gospel lesson clearly illustrates why. At first, the prodigal son didn't realize he was lost. After he went solo, he was free to be by himself, to be himself, the person he was born to be, have some fun, follow his dreams, and do all the things that he previously was never allowed to do, pursue his destiny. He finally had some privacy. He was officially on his own. No longer was anyone holding him back, and he was eager to go. But how did it feel to be on his own, with no direction home, like a complete unknown, like a rolling stone? Pretty lousy. His leaving led him nowhere, and he found nothing but trouble. His freewheeling departure left him weak, starving, wanting, and alone, because the prodigal son sought his own sinful solitude. Fine wine, foreign food, fancy clothes, and poor pricey prostitutes. He satisfied his every desire, and it consumed him, costing him everything. He was handed a fortune by his father, and he spent it foolishly on empty pleasure and sinful vices leading to spiritual poverty. And we're no different. When we fail to seek solitude with God, we're essentially running away from home, going solo. And when we go solo, we end up so low and lonely that we wish we'd never left home in the first place. We envy swine and wallow in squalor, enslaved to strangers, until by God's grace, we come to our senses and crawl back to our Father. Sin is running away from home. Repentance is crawling back to it. And forgiveness is being met, not with clenched fists and locked gates, but with the open arms of God's grace. Seeking solitude with God can humble us before him, and curb our sinful pride and insolence, that we may receive the welcome of his forgiving presence. Then, as it says in Psalm 68, God settles the solitary in a home. His Spirit consoles us, and in the grace of Christ, our Father absolves us. So prioritizing prayer and studying scripture can cause us to realize when we've wandered too far, need to turn back, repent, and confess the events of our detour to God. As it says in Acts 3, Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out in the forgiveness of Jesus. So find time to seek solitude and cherish being with God. Running off on our own leaves us weak and restless, but retreating to God strengthens and refreshes us. Which brings us to our next point, the solidity he offers. Essentially, Seeking solitude and being with God strengthens our faith, that we may believe in him even more faithfully. Because when we retreat, we find stability in his presence. Our Father is always waiting for us, and when our feet are firmly planted in his abiding word, the solidity of our faith is reinforced. Our lives have structure. We can settle down because we have a home. As it says in our epistle lesson from Ephesians chapter 2, You who are once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens and members of the household of God, built on the foundation, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. However, as we mentioned before, the devil doesn't want us to seek solitude with God in his word, since he knows all too well the power that it holds. He agrees that being with God strengthens our believing in God. Therefore, he wants us alone, to leave home, seeking our own desires and leaning on our own understanding, like the lost son in our gospel lesson. Satan doesn't want us to retreat to God and pray, because evil prefers easy prey. 
The lost Olympian son takes less effort to deceive. He's much simpler to defeat. The weak wandering sheep is easier to eat. And so his best strategy is to tempt us away from our father, to wander outside his gate, aiding us further down the road and farther from our home into lesser, leaner pastures, until eventually we're so hungry that we're willing to eat anything. Dropped pig pods, poisonous plants, plastic wrappers, and filthy trash. Once we're willing to lick any empty can he throws our way, that's when he knows we're too weak and unsteady to run away, and we may fall prey. This is the danger of wandering away from God's word and not seeking solitude with him. We lack solid food, and weakened, fall to sin. When we become separated from all that is good and true, even forbidden fruit can look good for food. But there's no nourishment in it, for sin is always poison. And as Adam and Eve can testify, just because something is edible doesn't mean it's edifying. As we see in Genesis chapter 3, when the women saw the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. But of course, it did not make them wise, nor divine. They now simply knew sin. The delightful appearance was simply a disguise. It was empty inside. The devil deceived them and the tree fell them. Thus, what followed was the fall into sin. Man gained nothing but loss and shame. And ever since then, our own sinful desires are constantly tempted by hollow idols, empty wisdom, and worldly sinful slop. Therefore, every day we must seek the word of God and ask our Father for help. As it says in 1 John chapter 5, We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. Little children, Keep yourselves from idols. This is exactly why time with God is so important. His word is our strength, and by meditating on it, the Holy Spirit solidifies our faith in the truth in Jesus Christ. That which we receive in solitude with God is fulfilling. His word is solid. Whereas everything our world offers is empty, it's nothing but idols. God can't stand idols, and neither can we. Idolatry consumes us and makes us weak. But when we seek solitude, God's word gives us solid food. Our Father throws a feast, and our faith is nourished. We have solidity. In all honesty, we don't want to be a rock, or an island, or a complete unknown like a rolling stone all alone and lost. We don't want to become just another guy in a Hank Williams song. We want a home with the cornerstone. We need solidity and to be found in Christ. As you may remember, a couple weeks ago we had quite a storm. A strong wind and heavy rain fell hard and rather suddenly. The next morning as I was walking up the hallway, I happened to glance out the glass doors of the emergency exit next to my office and I noticed something was missing. The giant boulder was gone. The wind and rain had blown it 20 feet down the yard towards the building which is why Pastor Nelson and I decided just to carry it the rest of the way and place it near the entrance. The reason this rock is so great is because I can lift it. But the reason I can lift it is because it's empty. It's a terrific decoration, but a terrible foundation. When it comes to faith, the last place we want to build our home is on a stone which we could lift on our own. We need a cornerstone that can stand the wind and the waves and bear the weight of the world. We want a rock much stronger than ourselves, one that's existed before we could stand and that shall still be standing long after we're laid to rest. Thus we can find comfort in the fact that Isaiah 48 says, the word of our God will stand forever. Outward appearances can be deceiving. Saying we have no sin and putting up a front is like building a house on the sand. It won't stand because there's nothing to back it up. Likewise, unless Christ is the foundation, all is lost, including us. And outside of Jesus' forgiveness, we can't stand up to the final judgment of God. As Jesus says in Matthew 7, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them 
will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. So don't settle for lightweight faith and empty idols. Settle down in a permanent home on the rock of salvation. All earthly wisdom is ultimately vanity, but God's word is eternally solid and saving. Which brings us to our final point, solidarity. Philippians 1.27 says, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And rightly so. Jesus died so we may live. Clearly, to be living for anyone or anything other than him is to forsake his life and to waste our own. And yet, we all know it's harder than it sounds. That as sinful men and women, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yet in Christ, we find solidarity. And in the peace of his presence, we receive who he is, the peace which this world is unable to give. Sometimes, when we're feeling weak, we may think of quitting. There may be days when we even feel like dying. But in those moments of grief, remember these words about Jesus found in Hebrews 2.18. Because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So even when we feel lonely, we can know we're never truly alone. And in his company, there is comforting because Jesus knows what we're going through. As it says in Hebrews chapter 4, Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus didn't just imagine himself in our shoes. He washed our feet. He didn't simply consider our position. He took our place. And not only did he weep for us, but he wept with us. Our Savior knows what it's like to struggle, to suffer, and to know sorrow. He knows the pain of bleeding, and he's experienced the anxiety of dying. But not only does he know what you're going through, he went through it all just for you. Even more, in taking our sin, in being crucified on the cross for our forgiveness, he experienced something far worse, the hell of being forsaken by the Father. This is the definition of damnation, and it's a far greater anguish than we can even imagine. Indeed, the solidarity of Jesus extends beyond mere sympathy or even empathy. What Jesus has done for us is far greater. Our Savior has shown us mercy. He entered flesh and endured our death, that we may receive his life and share in a resurrection like his. That's an incredibly understated way of expressing it, yet overwhelming nonetheless. The gospel is the greatest gift ever given, and to meditate on it with God in his presence is always time well spent. So never forget that that's how much God loves you. Jesus suffered the greatest isolation so that you may be forgiven and return home to your heavenly Father for the only feast that lasts forever. In summary, as it says in 1 Chronicles 16.11, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Seek solitude, solidity, and the salvation of his solidarity. Be with him, believe in him, and be living in him for all eternity. Your Father is waiting, and His grace awaits. So go on home as a child of God. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, and through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of 
join in confessing our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you have not already done so this week, I would like to encourage you to reflect upon your tithes and offerings to the Lord. If you would like to mail in your tithes or offerings, you may do so to the mailing address that is on the screen. If you would like to give your tithes or offerings online, you may do so on our website. Simply go to the website rlc.life and click the Give Online button. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.